hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Tatiana Hernandez, CEO of the Community Foundation Boulder County. And I, I really just want to note what Jennifer just said at the end there, because I understand the philosophy is like community first. And we were getting so many calls from folks who wanted to parachute into our community that I absolutely look side eye at every single person who wasn't from our place. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about community foundations generally, and forgive me because I have notes. Uh, the one thing I've already learned today is not to follow Jim Alvey. Um, but I did plan this to have just 10 minutes of conversation and then open it up to Q&A, so feel free, take notes, and we'll come in in about 10 minutes. Okay, show of hands, how many folks are familiar with community foundations? Let me get my clicker. All right, great, thank you. How many of you live somewhere where your community foundation took an active, meaningful role in disaster recovery? Interesting, okay, thank you so much. So similar to the way we describe disasters, if you've seen one disaster, you've seen one disaster. If you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation, and we'll get into community foundations specifically. The word foundation is as broad as saying company. There's private foundations, there's family foundations, et cetera. So community foundations are also particularly unique because they often take on the characteristics of the community that they're serving. And then there is a wide spectrum of their level of risk tolerance. I'll put it that way. Okay, so what is a community foundation? Uh, Fundamentally, community foundations were nonprofits that by definition are committed to serving a geographic area. We often have assets that are a mix of um, different kinds of funds. Some of those might be from individuals. You guys have heard of donor advised funds. Some of those are foundation specific funds for an area, for a geography, for a population of people, et cetera. So an easy but imperfect way to think about community foundations is like a philanthropic bank. People hold accounts and money gets, goes in and out. When a disaster hits, sometimes, and the field likes to think of themselves this way, so I will also get sassy with Jennifer on this, is community foundations will often step in and take a role. They'll invite people to give money, but they don't always have a plan for how that money will be distributed, and I will tell you that when um, the, the, the quote-unquote best practices that are out in the world, I find, um, I find problematic personally. So we'll, we'll go in there in a second. So you might ask yourselves, why do, you, why do community foundations do this? Well, we don't have to, and sometimes it's not a community foundation that takes the lead. Some of you may have a united way in your community that took a lead in philanthropic. Some of you may have, um, you know, in some cases, it's the Red Cross. It really depends on what your makeup of nonprofits are. I would, oft, I would say that it matters for whoever takes the donation lead in an aftermath of a disaster to be homegrown of and from your community because that means the dollars will stay in your community versus going to a national a home office. Um, but regardless, so of and from, and that they have experience in taking in dollars and distributing at scale. So S Jim said something earlier about like, or no, it was Jen, uh, you know, someone said something earlier about giving out little bits of money as if that's gonna help. Okay, so you've met one community foundation, you've met one community foundation, meet us. Um, we are founded in 1991, we're a mix of all those different kinds of funds, uh, around 90 million in assets, obviously that fluctuates with the market, that fluctuates with any given year. Um, and as Jennifer mentioned, we are no strangers to disaster philanthropy. We, were, we had held six different disaster-related funds in our 30-year history. That was before the Marshall Fire. So now this is our seventh disaster-related fund, and three of those, four of those now, since 2020. So COVID, we had a fire in 2020, as many, I think, people in this room did. Um, we had a mass shooting in 2021 and then ended the year with the Marshall Fire. So we're no stranger to that. As you might imagine, we were paying very close attention um, on December 30th, 2021. At 10.30 in the morning, we were in the middle of our staff meeting, and one of our staff members was evacuated by first responders as we were on the Zoom in the middle of our staff meeting. That was for the wildfires that were burning in the middle of the county. So there were three different wildfires burning on December 30th, 2021. She gets evacuated from the Middle Fork Fire. <laughs> I can't believe I remember the name, Val. 
Um, by 11 a.m., we heard of another fire near the Marshall Trailhead. By noon, we understood that 32,000 people were being evacuated. By 3 o'clock, and I'm giving you the timeline and I'm getting a little bit of chills and sorry if my voice cracks a little bit, but it was a day that felt like the heavens opened up and someone said Draconis and like it was gone. By three o'clock, we knew it was a massive disaster. Um, I reached out to the head of our Office of Emergency Management. Obviously their center was up and running. We have really good relationship uh, with our county partners and I was like, hey Mike, this sounds bad. He goes, it is bad. I'm like, do we need a fund? Yeah, we need a fund, okay. So by five o'clock, by the time the county did their first press conference about the Marshall Fire and what they were starting to see, we had our fund open and active and the county was directing people to us because we knew that that was gonna be the next question. Like, well, how can we help? Of course we want people to help. Too many things to do, not enough hands. All right, um, many of you are probably, who's familiar with National Disaster Recovery Framework? Have, has, have you all seen this? Okay, it's a little bit. Um, I'm pausing here just to mention that what we found, two things. One, the national best practices drive me absolutely crazy. I can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, specifically for community found foundations, the best practices drive me crazy. Um, and secondly, what we found is that very few nonprofits work across this entire spectrum. Folks either work in the immediate response and then they're gone, or they're in the long-term response and then they're gone, or they're in fire mitigation, or they're specific populations, but like no one takes on the fullness of this continuum, except for local government. <laughs> um, and that leaves local governments holding like the entirety of this often without the timely funding to do it or the expertise to do it. And we're like, okay, that's a mess. <laughs> this is all, we're, you know, we're figuring this out kind of in real time. So keeping this framework, also I'm just gonna name, this is all services, right? This framework talks about all of the different services that people need. Nowhere in this is the financing of any of this. <laughs> Nowhere in that. So we're money folk, we're like, Where's the money? Ay, ay, ay. So knowing that this was happening, knowing that this was the model, knowing that our local government partners do what they do best, which is keep people safe, get the fire out, set up the DAC, our Disaster Assistance Center, we knew we had those partners who could do that. We said, okay, great, go do that. We're gonna go raise a bunch of money. Of course, we weren't just gonna raise money and sit on it, because that's not our style. Uh, two days after the fire, our board approved up to five and a half million in direct financial assistance to fire affected households that look like $2,500 for households of one. Here's, let's start by saying, we make decisions based on data, right? So two days after the fire, we're like, what do we know? What do we know? We knew there were 1,084 houses burned, full stop. That's all we know. And we know that because our assessor's office told us that. We said, okay. Let's say it's a couple, you know, if it's a couple, 2,500 bucks, if it's a family of three or more, $5,000, enough money to get people a car, a deposit on an apartment, whatever they need. We weren't gonna dictate what that was, but we wanted to give people enough money at a high enough level to let them stabilize the way they felt it was important to stabilize. Um, we did that for fire damaged and destroyed households. We later did that for smoke and ash damaged households. As soon as we understood that that was another layer, we still don't have really good numbers on the num on how many smoke and ash affected homes there were from this event. We estimate 200, but that's because we've done some crazy GIS like data thing. Um, <laughs> and then we also included something for lost livelihoods. So we, you know, obviously everybody would be um, eligible for unemployment insurance, but that's gonna take a minute to kick in. We didn't want anybody to, I don't know, lose their apartment, not be able to pay meals. We had a limited number of businesses that burned. Uh, all told, and let me also stop by saying, we immediately followed that like two days after the fire with grants to United policyholders because we knew they needed to be on the ground very quickly as well as a suite of mental health services. So BVSD got some money. We had a crisis counseling program with a local mental health provider, made sure they were up and running and ready to take and support fast. All told, um, and we had a local advisory committee that was made up of people from Louisville, from Superior, from unincorporated Boulder County. 
All told, $7 million went out in direct financial assistance in the first two, two six weeks-ish after the fire. So by June of 2022, 2022, what year is it? We had raised over $40 million. Um, Seven million had already been distributed, and so we really, obviously, next question, what's next? Too many things to do. Okay, state agencies, thankfully, had taken stock of losses, and to the surprise probably of nobody in this room, we realized that the underinsurance gap was gonna be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So obviously, that was the number one barrier to rebuilding. Our committee decided that we had three priorities. One, incentivize people to get back into their homes. Two, make sure the folks who need more support get more support. Three, make sure there are wraparound services, whether that's mental health, insurance navigation, just navigating all of the different agencies that you have to be a part of, et cetera. So those were our three priorities. On the um, rebuilding side, we dedicated $20 million of the fund to support rebuilding efforts. So that looked like a $20,000 baseline grant to any household that had a, an insurance gap that got added on if you were a lower moderate income household, that got added on if you were an elder or someone with dependents in the house or a person with a disability or da 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 da, da. We did the math and the Willy Wonka house would, got, would have gotten like $58,000. Okay, just to put that in context. Um, we also allocated 2.5 million for basic needs for all fire affected households. So regardless of whether people are rebuilding, they have support. Um, this has gone to pay for rent, food, transportation, medical needs. We're about halfway through that two and a half million. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. We, we dedicated two million for PPDR, or PPDR, but I'll talk about that later. And then the wraparound services, like I said, mental health, nonprofits, et cetera. Here we are, 20 months later. And shockingly, over 55% of homes are rebuilding. 13% of people are actually back in their homes. Uh, Jen mentioned earlier about like, as CEOs come in, people welcome um, and you know, welcome folks back into their homes. That gift basket that they get is funded through an organization that we funded, again, to make sure that folks are in um, feeling celebrated. We think it's kind of bizarre, and um, I find it astounding, right? The national average is 25% of homes are rebuilt after five years. We're double that in half the time. I will say we cannot ignore the reality that Boulder County is a relatively well-off, well-educated, what did you call it, Jen? <laughs> We have lots of time on their hands. Um, civically engaged, right? But still, like there, there was big gaps here that we were trying to meet. This is just an overview of how the fund broke down. And I'm gonna talk two minutes about that one right there, the unallocated, which was a big chunk to Jim's point earlier about a lot of funding goes out the door in the first moments. Not a lot is around for that middle time, and then there's almost nothing for long term. So again, it's been 20 months in Colorado, and I don't know what, how this works in other states, but in Colorado, uh, most households will have 24 months of additional living expenses as part of their insurance. Um, some didn't. We won't get into the details on that. Division of Insurance did manage to negotiate some extensions. but So we're two, 20 months out. And that 24 month deadline is looming large on the horizon, regardless of whether people are rebuilding or not. Or not. So we are looking at potential additional living expense shortfall of around $7 million, which just so happens to be how much we've held and unallocated um, because my math is shockingly good. So <laughs> we haven't made that um, public. We still are working out some details on like, do we, will we require an in income cap, et cetera. But we knew that this was gonna be kind of that last haul stretch for a lot of our fire survivors. Last thing I'll say, um, going back to what uh, Jim said, we knew right away, we immediate short long-term needs, the best practices in the field are really just support the services, like there's not, really an encouragement in the field of philanthropy to do any kind of direct financial assistance, to do any kind of support that benefits households because of something called, um, I, I can't remember the IRS term, basically, 
per, well, personal endearment, but in, in the field of nonprofits, you'll, um, you have to uh, distribute based on need, and um, it's like charitable group, charitable class. That's the term. Basically, there has to be a community benefit, right? So most foundations will be really, really weird about doing anything that might stink of personal endearment. We took the philosophy that losing 1,100 homes in our house is a community loss, and to bring those homes back is a community benefit. So um, I'll stop there and see if you guys have any questions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So my question is around collaboration. So, um, you know, part of what we understand, right, is that uh, large national organizations have uh, strengths in certain areas in terms of uh, scalability and sort of some best practice learnings. Um, and then local organizations have a really, uh, obviously, a better sense of com uh, the local community. And how do we how do we foster more collaboration so that we're uh, capitalizing on the strengths across these different organizations and compensating for weaknesses amongst these organizations and how do we get that collaboration to happen uh, sooner rather than later uh, when these disasters come about? Yeah, great question, Jim. Um, I mean, I'll start by saying it was really helpful that, uh, so for context, Boulder County, we're 330,000 people, a county government, four city governments, seven town governments, and we all know each other, right? So it wasn't about like all of a sudden we're having to get to know each other in the process of collaboration, but it was a text message to Mike and a text message to Katie and a text message to other people and then be like, let's get on a call. All of you guys know the first like 30 days after a disaster, after a fire is, what do you know, how do you know it? What do you know, how do you know it? Um, so I will say, I mean, and I put this up because and this isn't a, a comprehensive list. It really does, I think, for any given community, like what are the nodes, right? So for us, it was like there's a county node, there's a state node, there's the local node, like a superior rising, and then connecting the nodes appropriately so that everybody's working off the same information. I don't know that that answers your question, but yeah, it's, a, it's an all-in effort. You were supposed to solve all of our problems post disaster to make all. How how do all philanthropic organizations work together? Oh, all philanthropic organizations. All, how about all all organizations? Great question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you want to hear a funny story? My favorite funny story post our disaster was there was a meeting of local government, state government, county governments, and they all decided it was gonna be us that was gonna lead the disaster recovery and they for forgot to invite us to the meeting. Oh, that's actually the most perfect It was excellent, it was so story. epic. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the reasons I live in Colorado is because people described us as the West Coast of the Midwest. Right, we're, we're like all the progressive can, we can do it, right? Like innovation, we can do it with the get it done, salt of the earth. There's not a lot of pretense and it really, we all kind of trying to barn raise together. I think if there's anything I can offer is just remind people of that throughout the process. Like we all are moving in the same direction. So let's start there. And for us it was, and what are you bringing to the table? How do we bring it all together? Anyway. Thank you. I, I remember having to turn to somebody in the first year of our disaster who decided that even though his organization covered um, a tiny uh, part of our fire, like literally a tiny part, he decided he covered all the areas I covered, every county, exactly my job, in a large presentation to Bay Area Council. And I was like, so blank, blank. There's enough disaster for all of us, as it turns out, and it's hard even when we're all working together. So why don't we do that? We're still not friends, but that's fine. Thank you so much, Tatiana. I really appreciate it. Big hand for Tatiana. Thank you.